Hey everybody, welcome back to Tipsy Testing. I'm Jessica Moore with Inflectra and we are happy to have you with us today. Um, we have a couple of friends from Sauce Labs who we miss terribly. Uh, Jane McNeil and Kat Stevens are joining us today. Uh, Jane is uh, a director of engagements for the Sauce Labs field services team. She works with customers worldwide to help them gain momentum as they address quality in their organizations. With more than 15 years working in tech and specifically test automation, Jane's expertise lies in helping customers get started with automation, making them confident enough to address their digital transformation challenges. Jane, can you tell us a fun fact about yourself? Um, sure, yeah. I appreciate getting a little bit of advance notice about the fun facts. So next week, I'm actually going up to Newfoundland in Canada. So I will be a half hour ahead of everybody else. I'm in uh, four hours ahead of San Francisco, but it'll be four and a half hours ahead starting next week, which will be interesting <laughs> to see how I adjust to that. Half hour, that is a fun fact. I didn't even realize there were half hour time zones in North America, so that's cool. Places. There's a handful of places in the world and Newfoundland happens to be one of them, so. Nice. But the weather in Newfoundland is really nice right now too. It, it, we've got a limited window for it being nice. So I've got to get up there in October and, and uh, try and get out of there before November when it gets really, really cold and there's lots of moose and uh, snow. <laughs> you know, when it's 90 degrees, moose and snow don't sound so bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, also joining us this week is Kat Stevens. Kat is the Senior Marketing Events Coordinator at Sauce Labs, where she has called her work home for the past two years. In January of 2020, she was one of the recipients of the President's Club Award for her customer service and diligent work at the many trade shows, test automation days, internet sauce events, sauce cons, and customer sauce days that happen throughout the year. You may be familiar with Kat as she is a staple at most Techwell, O'Reilly, and STP cons, as well as other shows around the US. Prior to getting into event testing technology world, she was an event coordinator at SRI International, the University of California, San Francisco Health Force Center, and the LGBT Center of San Francisco. She holds a BFA from SUNY Purchase and is set design and in set design for theater and film, which is super cool. And I don't know how you have more fun facts than that, but Kat, <laughs> what's your fun fact? Um, so even prior to getting my BFA in theater arts and film, I my first job was bur at a Burger King. If you're not familiar with it, it's just like McDonald's. Uh, but uh, my job was to make the Whoppers, and I made the fastest Whopper in all of New York State in 18 seconds. <laughs> it was edible. Uh, I didn't drop it on the floor. It was, uh, yeah. So they gave me a little plaque, um, and I believe my mom still has that. So, yeah. No way. Speed burgers. Fast, 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 so yeah. <laughs> Good for you, that's awesome. Um, and of course we have Adam Sandman with us today. Adam has been a programmer since the age of 10. He's been working in the IT industry for the past 20 years. He's currently the Director of Technology at Inflector Corporation, and he is interested in technology, business, and innovation. And Adam, your 19th, actually 20th, because last oh, week no. you what is your 20th fun fact? My Okay, so my 20th fun fact I, I, is that um, I, I'm a bit of a renegade driver, as anyone who's ever driven in my car will ever attest to, that I don't like using the brakes. I like to uh, take corners at full speed. And I think I'm a bit of a control freak because I've never ever used, I, ha I will refuse to ever use cruise control. My wife's always like, why don't you use cruise control? Like, I don't want something controlling the speed. So I've never, I've never once, from Boston to San Francisco, I was the only driver in 10 days. I didn't use cruise control the, any, the whole time. Wow. 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 Um, and I did, and I stopped at Carhenge in Alliance, Nebraska, which was the most fun thing I think we did in the entire trip. But it was all pretty good, but that was one of the highlights of seeing Carhenge. If you, if you been there. It's like a Stonehenge Stone made out of cars and painted silver. Ah, it's really cool. <laughs> and, I, and I'm actually British and I've never been to Stonehenge. <laughs> but I have been to Alliance, Nebraska, which has one hotel in the entire town. And the only reason to go to the hotel is to go see Carhenge. But it's in all the guidebooks. That's amazing. Huh. It is pretty cool. Right. We it's need, full size. I think we need an Inflectra RV <laughs> and a West a West Coast road trip. Oh, please do. That sounds epic. Did, 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 Jessica, didn't you do a road trip with your, your family once on an RV? You said it was, it was terrifying? Uh, well, it was terrifying in Yosemite. 
because you can't RVs are so big yeah. and the guardrails are so little you can't there's no way to see over the edge so you could be driving yourself right off a cliff and not even know it but I think if we stay on the open roads of Utah and Nebraska and then when we get outside of San Francisco we'll just call Kat to come and meet us on the same road <laughs> Exactly. I, I call me. I am there. I mean, I'll even meet you at Sacramento. I'll go even as far as Reno to meet you guys. So I'm okay. there. Yeah. It's it's a date. It's a, yeah. Oh, we've got a lot of fun friends to see out west. We and spray Carl. the side of the van. We can have a spray the side of the van with a logo and yeah. I love I, that. Love it. We don't have to fly to conferences anymore. We can drive the bus. <laughs> the inflector <laughs> party bus. That's what Rick does from STPCon. He does. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not unprecedented. Okay, put that in next year's budget. <laughs> All right, let's get started. It, I was going to say in a more serious note, but let's not be serious today because <laughs> what a week. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So uh, we have a couple of people who join us regularly, and it's fantastic. It's always great to see them and see what questions they have. So this is from Violetta, who's been a regular listener. Do you have any tips for how to communicate with customers to to be listened and to be heard? Jane, do you want to start with that? Uh, yeah, I think it's important to listen and to actually listen to your customers. Uh, and a lot of that can be facilitated by a really good question asking. Um, we found that since we've been working with this COVID, um, we've we've limited. We we have a travel team. I, I run and manage a travel team with Marcus Maryland. So. We love being on site with customers and we can't do that right now. And it's really hard for us because we miss being on the road and we miss being around people. Um, so what we've done instead is we've designed like half day sessions where we get to work with our customers pretty closely, but it's super important that we're asking them specific things and, and we're getting their feedback. We want them to participate. It's very easy to tune out on Zoom calls if you're just being talked at the whole time. Um, so I think it's it's more critical now than ever, and it's something that we're gonna carry forward as soon as we can get back out and travel and be with our customers. Um, I find that show and tell with customers is a, is a great way to listen. Um, we talk a lot about kind of abstract concepts and things and theory, um, but once you start to get into the code and how people have structured things, um, you have very different conversations. So visual aids help, um, great questions help, and just keep asking the questions so that you're you're really getting to understand um, what your customers are going through. And and as far as being heard by your customers, I think once they have that, you have that mutual respect with them, when they know that you've been listening, they know that you understand what they're going through, they're much more receptive to advice and guidance and they seek it out. Kat, do you have anything to add? Yeah, that's that's great, Jane. Like I agree with Jane 110. percent um, You know, I I was just going to add on to that is there's there's two ways you know of where when you say on communicate of like what the customer wants and is standard is like do you want to do you want to connect like on a phone or is email best? But I apply any communication to um, what I would do just in general for what I learned way early long time ago is the five pillars of you know transparency empathy self-awareness context and flexibility and um not to go too boring on this but the transparency it's i i always want to tell my customers or my clients or prospects tell it what, what like how it is just doesn't do any good to kind of not be forthright or that this might not be the best idea for to use our product or just not Really, really removing the BS from it um, of, of being transparent. The empathy, especially now in this um, this COVID landscape, it's it's seeing yourself as a member of your client's team and understanding the challenges they face and the struggles that they're up against, and um, you know, of, of really seeing yourself integral with 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 your client, with your customer, of being not um, you know on their team. The self awareness is just be yourself and don't be inauthentic context it helps you see what your customers um through the lens of automation testing or even bigger ones it's kind of like the empathy but just in a larger scale and then flexibility of um every customer is different so like i said you know what's what's best back in the day do you want to meet up for drinks do you want to meet up for dinner or should i call you should i text you should i email you what just customizing tailoring to uh, suit your customers needs 
I do love that point about empathy. If I can just interject a little bit, um, I think that's 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 just spot on. Um, that if you don't understand where your customers are coming from and you can't put yourself in their shoes, you can't serve them. Like you just, it's impossible. Um, so it's it is it's critical, and and they notice it when you are empathetic because we step into situations all the time where it's like, yeah, if you were if you were doing a greenfield deployment or an implementation of something, this is how you would design it, but we never walk into that situation. You've got <laughs> you've got a lot of history. You've got a lot of decisions that were made before you got to that point, and um, your customers have been dealing with that for a while. And so it's not like just go make these changes. They they have to develop a plan that's going to make sense for their organization. And that empathy point is key for all of that. Yeah. Hundred mm percent. -hmm. Yeah. Adam. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with everything that that, that that was said. I mean, you have to basically listen to your clients and understand the context which they operate in. One of the things that we often find, though, is that because we're often dealing with engineers, particularly on the support side, an engineer will raise a say, say a support ticket, and they're going to have already made. They've already kind of they've got the business problem they're trying to deal with they've come up with what they think is the right technical solution and then they hit some roadblock and they'll log or raise a ticket or call because they hit the roadblock the the, the problem is it is sometimes what they were trying to do isn't the right even business solution and so you have to sometimes get them out of their current thinking and say well hold on before, before we answer your question which i could answer but that won't actually solve your problem that will just answer your question what are you trying to actually do? What is the business problem you're solving with this particular thing you want to do? Because there's actually some other ways you could do it which will actually be less work for you. And that really helps them, at least the customers that are willing to be open. And then we sometimes have customers that aren't willing to be open. That can be very challenging when the team is trying to educate them. And they, they I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it this way. And so sometimes you have to also not, not argue with the client. Ultimately, it's your choice. We recommend this other way of doing something, but always having the maturity to know that you have to at some point let them try. And then they may come back and say, oh, actually, you were right. I tried that. It doesn't work very well. This is much easier. So it's, but I think it's asking the business question or why, what is the why behind what they're doing? Because they'll usually log a ticket or call you about the what, not the why. And I think mm -hmm. that some of our, our support engineers who are engineers, they want an engineering solution to an engineering problem. And some of it's not an engineering problem that they're trying to solve. It's a business problem. And so training your engineers to think like, business consultants as well as engineers is, is really important. Um, and the other thing I think about that is also when people move from sales and pre-sales to support, you don't want to make them feel like they were sold something in sales that was not the same as what they're going to get in support. So having a continuity of expectations is really important. You don't want your salespeople being bonused and commissioned to sort of like, oh, yes to everything, and then support's answer is no to everything. That's the worst thing you can do, and that happens a lot in tech companies, and we hear that from from customers who you know worked worked at other places. They're like, "Well, am I getting the sales answer or the support answer? What am I getting?" Like, well, for us, it's the same, but I understand what you're saying. Um, so I think being authentic and being transparent, like Kat said, is really important. If the answer is going to be no in support, you should say what the answer is no in sales, because always you're just creating a client that's going to be unhappy and write one star reviews and not be a reference and chew up all your support time and be a drag on you and be unhappy. And who wants that? Totally. Totally. Yeah, excellent point. And it can get back to asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Jane, can you talk about some common challenges that test organizations face when introducing automation? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> Maybe we'll think about something a little bit more specific. Uh, that's that's what my team uh eats and breathes every single day. So yeah, it's it's quite challenging when people are starting to make that shift. I think the biggest specific thing that I can think of is that we go from these like manually tested scripts that we want to convert into automation. Um, there's something about like seeing a test run through a business process flow that people kind of expect. And that's not really the nature of like how great automation is written. It's, it doesn't necessarily follow that same standard business process where you're throwing a bunch of other variables and factors and things into it we want to see things that are um, much more compartmentalized we want to see atomic autonomous you know short tests for that automation um, so we see that happen a lot where you get these complex end-to-end -end scenarios and people are just pushing this through and trying to make it an automation i think it's kind of an important step like there's some like there's got to be some psychology behind this that people have to see it run in order to trust and to believe that it's actually working for them before they could take that step to do automation the way that we would ultimately want them to do automation where they're breaking things apart 
So I don't love walking into an environment where we see complex end-to-end -end scenarios that are done for absolutely everything that boiled the ocean. They've, they've converted an entire like manual testing practice over into automation that way, because you're going to have to break that apart at some point. Um, but I think that that's, that's probably one of the bigger challenges. You just, you have to tell people, hey, at some point, you're going to get to this way and this is how this is going to work. But almost to your point, Adam, about like, they'll ask for a specific solve you kind of have to go along with them for a little bit and then just be open to them making um that change when they're actually ready for it and you have to wait until it's appropriate for somebody to be ready to make that type of a change so mm -hmm. yeah but i could talk for context specific around different customers i mean uh, <laughs> i guess did you wait yeah. for them to fail because i, I mean we have the same problem with some of our automation tools because they, you know, they're thinking like a manual tester and the demo that everyone does is i'll log in and create a this and create a that and review this you so for the demo you might do a simple end-to-end -end login type do something log out script because you know that's going to show them that automation is going to is going to meet their needs in a very short time frame for, of a demo like 10 five minutes but you know that's not what you're going to want to build a framework that's more reusable the expectations are hard yeah the expectations yeah. the, the managing the expectations on that so i don't think we we don't necessarily like wait for customers to fail i i expect that that's something that they're going to want to do and it's got this christmas where they connect with it and it makes sense to them and then they're like this is great it's saving me time it's just not done the way that you know ultimately once you get it to be optimized and and that's for us at sauce labs where we're not like super strict with our customers about how they they do those things because we know that this is all about optimizing things mm -hmm. and getting those incremental improvements mm -hmm. right so if they're taking a stab at it and they're running with these long end-to-end -end tests and they've got automation figured out, fantastic. They know how to automate. So now we could just teach them better ways to automate. And that's half of it. I think it's it's quite hard to learn these concepts at the beginning. And so you don't want to discourage and dissuade people when they're trying right. to, to get into that space, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You you said that you there were multiple scenarios that you had in your head or is there one that without naming names that was particularly interesting or challenging to deal with without naming names yeah i usually ask my customers um like what's the useful life of a test asset because i want people to start getting back towards testing that is more relevant and more current and much more agile and it should be purposeful um so i get concerned when i see test assets that are really really old uh things that are like five years old or whatever um so i think that's kind of a getting people to kind of get away from the stuff that they've built that's maybe no longer serving them anymore uh, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a shift so yeah. but that's hard because you've spent a lot of money and a lot of time and it's there and it's like, well will people see it's like an accumulated investment the capital investment they've made in all these scripts <laughs> and we can't lose those scripts because of all that money we spent and it costs them almost nothing to run it except that it it clouds the environment and that can harm your overall quality objectives mm -hmm. because you're getting lots of like false positives and things that have broken that people aren't maintaining so right. uh i tend to like i'm a big believer in marie kondo and like clearing <laughs> the clutter away from things um and i and i hope that people adopt that more but i understand like those decisions were made by lots and lots of people before we stepped into an office or a virtual session with customers. <laughs> so that's, yeah. Yeah. Right. Totally. Does this test case give you love? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Does it give you joy? No, it just fails all the time. It's flaky. I hate it. Throw it out. It's like, you know, it's it's like turn of the century furniture. Get rid of it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have much to add on on Jane's point um, because I put out from from a marketing point of view, I always hear of like that they that a team might not have buy in from QA management or finance department because it does take a lot of upfront costs and a lot of the the time can seem so overwhelming at the beginning, but the payoff is so worth it down the road. But it's it can lead to this discussion of the chicken and the egg where like you know testing teams just they they want to get through what. what what they have on their their plate right now, so to say, with their current load and that they just put off automation to hit the manual deadlines. But 
the longer you put off um, introducing automated testing, the more you're going to be overwhelmed with the manual testing. Um, so breaking out of that cycle is is important, and that's what that's a common thing I hear a lot on at trade shows or in general marketing. Uh and Kat, when you were at the booth, I mean, you were at the front line there, so you're at the booth, and you've got the, all the, you, know, you can you can show the scripts running on the screens and the demo, but the people are going to come and you say, well, can show me how an end-to-end -end test works, and show me how, they want, they, so you're in the same boat, like, well, actually, it's not, totally. how do you deal with that, when you, they're asking the questions that you know are the wrong questions, but there's people around you, you can't, like, you're an idiot, go away, go, go to their booth, follow them. I, so no, is I I tend a lot of times just to be like um, I mean never like go away, but but you know hey why don't we come over here and then I'll I'll put you know I'll I'll, I'll try to get someone else you know to to run the stuff, but I really break it down for them in a, in a much more granular sense. Um, but I, I'll I like yeah I mean also at the booth though you're swamped by like 300 people in certain shows, right. so it's you can't spend too much time on on that, but. I always really try to find those people at lunch and sit down so then to explain more <laughs> the, the right way to, the, yeah, the correct, the right phrasing. Right. I, yeah. I don't think it's a problem when people want to do end to end because that's the most basic, you know, preliminary right. understanding. So it doesn't take, it doesn't take a lot to build on that. I just think you, you can't be super adversarial at the beginning right. part of it. You need, to, you need to say, yeah, that works, but this also works so much faster. And also, you're definitely going to maintain this. This end-to-end -end scenario, things are going to change. You're going to forget about this, and you're going to move on. Yeah. So. It might be used. To, it might be used to sell the project internally to your to your management to get the money, but that's about all you need. That's it. Yeah. I feel like. Uh, that and in trade shows, there's always the people that are, the people I always feel, at least for us, who the people who actually ask questions because they want to know, and the people who want to ask questions are because they're trolls. They just want to like, why are you? They always say, why are you like Jira? Or, how are you different to this? Mm -hmm. How are you? You know. They don't ask you because they really want to know the answer. They just want to say they don't know what else. They don't know what else to say, and it's yeah. I don't know. They just want to see what you say. Totally, or to or to prove you wrong, which I'm like I'm totally wrong. I'm wrong all the time. So like you'll you'll catch me. I guarantee you, come to any show and you will catch me. I will give you like like all the swag I have because I will be wrong at some point. But right. but the I like more conversations where it's not out to get somebody. It's where we're learning off of one another, or um you know. I'd like I'm not just there to teach you. I I want to learn from you as well. So mm -hmm. as a two way street. Coming going back to the like customer where you know it's, even though it's not a customer at that moment, it's still an interaction. How do you listen and how do you how do you respond? Mm -hmm. I would just like to state for the record that Adam is actually much friendlier and more empathetic oh, in sorry. the booth. <laughs> he comes across right now. I, know, I was gonna say, Adam, you are so nice at like all the shows, and now I'm seeing like, well, you really feel. <laughs> you're really no, I mean, he doesn't even really feel that way. I, it's honestly, it's this week. I'm not kidding. In fact, maybe it's time to talk about our drinks because time for a sip. Yeah, okay. what are you drinking today in the in your fabulous glass? So full disclosure, um, since yesterday was the um, National Happy Testing Day. I was going to make a um, a drink called the Grace Hopper Thomas Edison, um, but I didn't have because I, I wanted to play around with this because you know since I believe she's the like the the woman who create you know found but Thomas Edison used the word bug and using his phones where she actually found the moth in her script so oh, right. I just went with wine because I didn't have anything else and I didn't have time to make this drink but uh, you know soon you'll have to invite me back because I will have Grace Hopper, Thomas Edison drink created. Is it like a grasshopper? I kind of hope it is. I'm thinking so. I'm thinking okay. so. Bug, moth, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. It's fantastic. I'm intrigued. Yeah. That sounds like the perfect kind of drink that you would have during a tipsy testing show. Right? See? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Jane, what about you? So, I'm drinking a dirty gin martini. Um, Cat is my favorite person in the entire world to drink martinis with. So I, I thought I haven't seen Cat in a while. So and it's just been a while since we've been able to do something kind of social and fun. And yeah, of course, exactly. Martini. Exactly. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. And that's such a good reason. If we should have had I known, I should have done a little bit more drink investigation before we started because we could have done martini testing. Oh, oh love that. Yeah. We did it in Manhattan testing. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, 
soon. But I'm a vodka martini, but Jane and I, we, we've been known to have many a martini together. So I can't, I can't wait till we can do that again. Oh, and in, invite you to as well. Invite, you know, invite everyone here on the call. She'll get, she'll get a text message from me. I'm like, oh, <laughs> <Just need martini. laughs> that's all I need. <laughs> it's good to have that friend. Yes, totally. Adam, what about you? What do you have today? Oh, in well, your I... coffee mug? Yeah, sorry about the coffee mug. I'm I'm a little short of, of silverware today and glassware. So today I, I, I was searching in the cupboard and, and here we're in the DC area and the government's all, you know, our own our own uh, apocalypse of government. And so DC Brow has a continuing resolution, which is the when the government can't figure out what it's doing and can't agree on anything. So they have to then pass a, 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 the, the, the money to go ahead without any discussions for the continuing resolution. And it's, it's a famous a local brewery called DC Brow, makes a great range of IPAs. And this is their continuing resolution, the dysfunction of our government. And I'm celebrating that today. Nice. I spent a, a portion of my career with the federal government and had several continuing resolution vacations because uh, of them. So thank you, taxpayers, for your... <laughs> <laughs> for my vacation um usually i don't go hard but i had to go hard today so i'm having some peaty delicious lafroy because 2020 has been rough and this week in particular has been a bear so cheers 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 um all right easing back into the questions i'm gonna start with you on this one kat what do you like the most at your current position what do I not like? I mean, I love, I, I love my current position. Even in, even in this crazy time and this crazy year, I really love being in marketing. Um, I love being in events. It, it just marries my two loves of, of, um, you know, interacting with people, but breaking it down a little more is I feel like in marketing, I can bring a lot of creativity to the table, um, in a lot of different areas, not just with marketing campaigns, but, um, bringing I tailor myself on really taking um, the side of the customer, so putting it through their lens and 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 the client of what what they want to see, what they would like. So whether that's um, a certain you know campaign on on communication or or even just as break you know reaching out to a, a big level client and and seeing what we can provide to them. Um, I just love the creativity I can bring into the many different teams throughout Sauce Labs. I can bring it to and interact with, and also just in general marketing and events. Uh, I mean, events—it's like its own crazy world um, where there's just so much going on, and every day is different. So it, there's no there's no monotony whatsoever in in the marketing or events world. So I love the unique challenges it brings, and I just really love um, interacting with with people. So. Yeah, I, I I I have no complaints. I, I just really, really love that. Um, you know, even through the age of COVID now, I mean with 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 this, it's it's broken down the interaction, but we're learning I'm learning to adapt in in these ways and, and really cherish though these kind of event this this event, you know, these these moments we have um together. So yeah. So your creativity at events really comes through too. You guys have the most um, unique booths they really stand out who else has a hot sauce i mean that's just so cool plus you're so friendly you were uh -huh. i didn't i only started at this job about a year and a half ago and i didn't know that i'd be attending conferences i didn't even know tech conferences were a thing um and you were one of the first people i got to know on the road and it and then to realize that i would get to see you every time we went to a conference um and it was you know you it, I, it was just you were such a friendly face and such a great way to kind of get to know the industry and um, everything stood out about Sauce Lab. So clearly, well, it's a good fit. That's awesome news to hear. And the same goes to I love Inflectra and I meeting Adam, Thea, and then yourself was just like, you know, you guys are my you guys are my people. I love you. You know, I miss you, and I'm so glad to see your faces here. And and uh, that means the world to me that you shared that with me too, Jessica. Thank you. I appreciate that. Road family. Yeah. Road family. Yeah. Exactly. I will say that we always love hearing how successful our events go and like the impact that people have. When Kat won the President's uh, Award, it, this was at our own sales kickoff, everyone in the company just went completely nuts. So like that love that you guys feel at Sauce, it's like, yeah, 
I don't even know how to describe it. I, but people were in tears. So it can be all oh. red. It's not just the wine that's going to be red. <laughs> You're making it. It's going to be so, a blush. Good moment. Good moment. Good moment. That's mm. excellent. Well, congratulations on that, too. That sounds like quite an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, was, it is. Jane, what about you? Uh, so I I work with like the coolest team at well I mean I don't know all the teams at Sauce are fantastic but I love my team um, I have all the rock stars on under Marcus Merrill's umbrella so I've got Nikolai Advalakin, Wim Sellis, Tyus Fortner, Josh Grant, and Marcus Merrill himself um, and I get to work with those guys every single day and it's just amazing. Um, we spend a lot of our time focused on specific customer problems, but we also carve out time. And this was something that was important to Sauce Labs that we spend time thinking about thought leadership, thinking about field engineering. Um, so where are things that exist within our platform and things within open source? And how do we really just try and make that easy and provide that feedback loop back to products? So as things are getting like field tested with um, different customers, we get that 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 feedback incorporated into the product as well. Um, so it's kind of an interesting group. I haven't actually seen tech companies run like this. They've got professional services and they have customer success, but field technology is like a very different hybrid. And it started with our deep commitment to open source. So everybody that works on this team, except for me, is a major contributor to Selenium and Appium projects um, and, and quite committed to it. And yeah, it's great to be around people that are just super, super passionate about the space, love their jobs, and it makes it really easy to work with them, so. That is, that's great. When you work with people who are passionate about what they do, and when you feel like you can learn from them every day, it makes, yeah. it, makes it exciting to go to work. Yeah, I, I don't even have to preface anything with them when I ask them questions, because they initially, when I started working with them, they knew I was a little bit like shy and uncertain, and they're just very, they love the space so much that when you do ask a question, they're excited that you're you're interested and they want to teach you and they want you to kind of grow. Um, and so they do it in a way that's very supporting. And, you know, it just I don't I don't preface anything with this might be a stupid question. Right? I don't do that with them at all, ever, because it's all valid for them. So yeah. great. Echoing yeah. what Jane said, they, I've gone to them with 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 just any kind of question and they're always happy have that their their team is known as the dream team outside of their circle because they're just awesome so yeah that's excellent that's cool. it sounds like a great place to work maybe not quite <laughs> <as inflectable. laughs> <laughs> adam what about you, what I was you gonna say, well i mean I, I think we're all gonna echo the same i mean I, I was thinking what is it about the company that i love so much is that the well, it's it's the people both the team that we that we have here at the company, which is just you know second to none, I, I love every working with every single one, and uh, that was actually been the hardest thing about COVID. Actually, for me, has been um, not everyone obviously works here in our office. We have people working in Europe and and Brazil and other places that we have and Boston, people in other offices. So it's not like we've always been we're not in one location, but the a hub of us were here in the DC area. So we'd go to the office every day. We see each other a lot, and I, I really miss that interaction, that that feeling of like a family, because I feel we are kind of a family firm. Mm -hmm. uh, we sort of have people we've hired, people we've known, other people were, were very much referral driven, people we've kind of found through other means. And so, I, it, it, especially the good thing with COVID though is I think, you know, because we can't go out and do other things, we spend more time with work. So it's made me really appreciate how much I really love my employees, you know, the people I work with and the other employees and the people, we, other partners we work with and our, our clients, because they, they become our social network because we're not doing all the other stuff. So our network is basically our family, you know, and our, maybe some friends if we're nearby, but many of our friends that aren't at work, we don't see as much. So actually, it's been fantastic to have such a great people to work with and, you know, look forward to coming in on Monday. And it's like, I've actually missed you guys. I've been at home by myself on the weekend and, you know, tired of my, my family and uh, so someone new and fun. Um, so not my family's fun too. Uh, but uh, no, I, I really, I think that's what's made such a, such a great, great part of the company is just that everyday experience. And then in general with tech, most of our customers and and most of we work with are just delightful people. I mean, we're, in, as an industry, we're very lucky that for the most part, when people, when someone calls you and they have a problem, they're trying to solve a problem. They're not angry. It's not like working in customer service or dealing with customers in maybe other industries where people maybe have access to grind. If they're if they're calling, they have a real problem that they want to solve and they they appreciate the help. And when we go to trade shows and conferences, it's it's we are such great people. Like you know yourselves and the, and all the conferences we go to. 
um, just a great family vibe. It's like going, you know, you go to these different events like Tech World versus STP, kind of agile testing days, and there are some different groups who go to the different ones. But it's like going to a holiday camp. It's sort of like, oh, we're paid to do this. This is great. I thought we had, this is like, you know, a vacation. It's more uh -huh. fun than a vacation because you actually get to know, when you go on a vacation, you're, you're seeing places and buildings, but here you get to go see a new city, but you get to go with your best friends. Yeah. So I think it's kind of, that's what I think I've missed the most about the year has been not seeing the people at the company, but also not being on the road and seeing people. Um, and although we do these things on Zoom or go to meeting and so on, it's not, it's not the same. It's not. So. It's better than nothing, for sure. Better right. than but can you imagine, Adam, like the first show back with like the, the, the amount of jubilee that people like, you know, that we'll all have, but then with with we'll never take just an interaction with a with with a with a person at the expo show for granted ever again. You know That's what I mean? True. That is true. This gonna be so like like I just can't wait. I I hold right. I rest my word like my that gets me excited for the future. So Absolutely. That's gonna so, be great. so when that person asks the question, how are you different from X, Y, and Z? We'll be like, thank you for asking that question. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I, I never thought I'd miss a, like a, a, a catered lunch at a hotel, you know? <laughs> rubber chicken! Mario, rubber chicken, where are you? I miss you. Or United, or, or at United Airlines, free glass of whatever that <laughs> Pinot Grigio is they've got going on there. Oh, yeah. Where are the like brownies and tea? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, Adam, I'm gonna start with you this time. Oh. What okay. does it mean to be an agile tester and what is the role of a tester in the agile team? Oh my goodness, that's a hard question <laughs> after the last one. Um, Sorry. An agile tester, so, and, I'm, and I, I'm gonna, I will preface this with that I'm not a tester. Uh, I work at a testing company, um, and I and I really want to make tests successful. I love agile teams, and we do a lot of work. But I'm not an actual agile tester myself. But what I think uh, what I think of agile testing is distinct from whatever testing was before. It's about um, not it's not about being this separate organization that's like behind a wall that they throw the test to. It's being part of the core team. You're helping to deliver and build the software. You're not just some adjunct uh, checking a box. So I think before testing, before Agile, sorry, testing was the team, the thing this other team did. So my team, we're the builders, we build all this cool stuff, and then you guys go break it. So as an Agile tester, you're an, you're an integral part of the discovery, feedback, Agile process. And if you're not, you're not really an Agile, well, your company isn't really an Agile testing organization, they're just saying they are. So I think, to me, that's what's really important. And the skills as, a, as an Agile tester are understanding your role to help the customer and be successful with your tool with, and, and if you can help the, the developers, the managers, the UI people understand the tool as it's going to be used and make it better and make your user experience better, then you have succeeded as a tester. That to me is the agile tester as opposed to a check the box, you know, send it back to development there's bugs in it. Totally. Totally. Jane or Kat, do you have anything to add? Well, Adam oh. stole my answer. So. <laughs> Way to go, Adam. <laughs> uh, I'll let Jane, like further on uh, more, but I like so I'm not a tester at all. I'm in marketing, but you know I what all what this what this question came to mind was Lisa Crispin when she was asked for like a, a clean definition. It's it's just so hard. It's still just yeah. like, what is agile testing? But um to me it just means continuous interaction between customers and developers. And where I always say this joke that you're um it, I'm dating myself, but like where you're Ernestine, the Lily Tomlin character at the phone operator where you're just plugging like you are just constantly in everything around so you know that's that's what that means to me but i'll let jane of course speak to this fully I, I, I did a great that's, yeah that's absolutely right to, to add on to exactly what adam said um and you can tell when customers are actual agile shops first when they're when they're talking about agile because it's like a buzzword and they want and they want to do the next and latest and greatest thing um I always find it telling if I ask somebody that's working in testing or working in quality, why are you doing this? And if they can answer that in a way that makes sense for the business, then I feel pretty confident that they're working on a team and they're working towards the same objective. So if they talk about, man, our customer experience wasn't that great and we wanted to make sure that it wasn't as buggy or there's a certain amount of revenue that we're trying to pursue. If they're talking about broad strategic objectives, 
concept of getting it because they're shoulder to shoulder with their devs, with the rest of the organization, trying to move these digital transformation projects forward. Um, so agile testers have that context in their mind. They know why they're doing things um, and they feel very much a part of those teams. And the best ones I think have a really great attitude of like service to their colleagues. So they think about like, you know, I want to help this person out. The wall that Adam was talking about is like, oh, it's this group, this other thing that, that exists over there. The ones that really get it right have reduced that wall down. They've reduced those types of barriers and they work collaboratively and they're working towards the same stuff. And uh, it's it's really refreshing to see it. And it's not, it's not just like a, a cost savings. It's not just getting things done faster. I think it improves the quality of that person's work life, you know, where you've got oh. that commitment. You, and I feel it with my guys. So when I see this with other customers, I'm like, yeah, I want to support that all day long. So, yeah, right. I mean, when, whenever we talk to customers that are in more, you know, I guess, it, and sometimes you have these outsourced testing teams that are in another time zone, and all they do is they wake up in the morning and they log in and they get you know 100 bugs or 100 you know, test scripts to run, whatever they, how it's been communicated. Imagine waking up every day and you have 100 test scripts to run and you go through at the end of the day, you log 100 bugs, and the next day you come back. And I mean, that is the most dispiriting kind of, you know, life. And so, as you say, it improves the quality of life if you're an integral part of the, the product creation, not just this task list that comes in from on far. Yeah, and, and, and how do you coordinate that when you get a massive list of bugs, right? I mean, do you ever really get to a root cause that goes along right. with this? And you do if you're working with, like, side by side with developers. It's like, oh, okay, this thing. And it impacts these other things, and so it becomes easier to problem solve when that's happening in real time versus, mm -hmm. you know, sending something over the fence to to this other team. And you shouldn't have that. You shouldn't have other teams. It should be one team. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah, that's really very well put. So this question is a little funky, and we've used it before, but I just think it's it can spur really interesting answers. So. I will start, I'm just going to throw it out there, um, and then Kat and Jane, if you need to ponder it for a second, we'll, we can put Adam on the spot, but what is the most ridiculous, badly planned, ill-advised thing or feature or product or solution you've ever been asked to test? Oh, wow. Oh. That's a that is a good question. That's a Isn't great that a question? question. I know it yeah. takes it, you have to think about it a second and and you know Adam's had to answer this a few times before so it's really not fair to put him on the spot but I I can talk about a system I didn't personally test but I know my old, my old company Sapien uh, consulting firm I won't mention the client because it's probably not allowed to but they they um there was a thing they had to test and then for, and and develop and it was a big big mistake it was an it was an automated bakery system so the the theory of this was that uh, if you go into a supermarket which will remain unnamed but a supermarket where you go and you can order like you know croissants and other pastry goods they had a they had a requirement that you had to be able to type in the system the, the, the label that would go on the bakery good and it had to appear on the printer and be printed out in x number of microseconds or microseconds from the point which it was ordered and they had to guarantee and, and Sapin had guaranteed the, the, the service level agreement that they would meet this and they hadn't read the contract properly and they would copied the system from another other supermarket which didn't have the same performance requirement and they pr priced and estimated the entire project based on being able to hit that, being able to do this, use the existing system, drop it in, and the other place, it was nowhere near fast enough, and so they ended up spending an entire extra year to build a whole new system, at no ex and it was a fixed price contract. And, in and, they had a test, and they had a test that they could print this label and have it ready to stick onto the croissant in X seconds after the person on the computer terminal originated the, you know, the pricing information. Whoa. That was pretty crazy. Good to have people who read through contracts yes they were a small company then <laughs> okay. oh but they're not now so maybe this worked out for them yeah maybe <laughs> <laughs> well they've been going like yeah they've had a bit of a yeah been up and down what about you jane or kat do you have any ideas i don't know if i have one about testing things that didn't make sense for the business but i have had a number of customers uh talk about how they didn't 
they had management or leadership didn't want to pursue a specific idea because they were looking at as is metrics for traffic. So for example, they didn't want to put a lot into their mobile focus because people weren't using mobile. Um, and so that kind of wasn't a reason not to do it. It was people weren't using the mobile solution because the mobile solution wasn't great and it wasn't intuitive. Um, so this person had to advocate to actually do testing on mobile and it served them really, really well um, because then they started to see an increase in demand for their mobile testing apps. So sometimes you have to challenge uh, those things. And I think the best customers that we work with know when to, when to stand their ground on those things. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I know I've been asked something, but I just nothing comes to mind besides, you know, the old language COBOL, but like that, that certainly didn't affect me. But uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to politely bow, like nothing's coming to, to the forefront right but now. But COBOL's come in the news because every single, I mean, it's unfortunately, every single unemployment office in this country is using old COBOL based systems that were not designed to handle the load of everyone with the coronavirus, you know, filing for unemployment benefit. And, and the demand for COBOL programmers has like skyrocketed. Maybe oh so so I'm oh I should I I should go back and really beef up on my skills on that then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean yeah, but look, I mean, it was awesome. yeah exactly. Sorry, but I mean because it was the millennium the millennium bug I think was the last time there was a huge demand of cobalt programmers and it kind of waned and everyone went back into do other stuff and then there were like some of the airlines had those major problems with their systems in the banks right. but then it's like it goes through waves. They say that the the most programming, the most lines of code out there in the world today is still COBOL. Believe it or not. Wow. Get out. I wouldn't. Wow. I did not believe that. Isn't that scary? Someone's telling me that. And then the other it's one, scary. there's not a huge number, but Fortran is still in use on most 737s. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so it's interesting because Kat and I were at a customer event once, and we saw a programmer from Google that was did a fantastic talk. It talked a little bit about being tech stock agnostic mm -hmm. um and i thought it was such a it was such a great talk um where he was like you know you feel bad about having this cobalt on your resume resume or whatever but you knew how to do something you knew and understood all the logic and you learned something and now you have skills that you can apply to other languages and you shouldn't see that as a barrier to entry and so i think a lot of that's still valid and you're right with financial and insurance we see a lot of that um, they're not making a shift over because it's secure and it's been working for them. And, you know, you don't change for the sake of change. Um, mm -hmm. if, if it's something that's serving your core business, you know, you have to respect that. I, I think look, you guys right? think, do you, do you all think then it'll go through another wave of this then that, that there'll be more need for it again, or well, I mean, or will we forever be in this cert like this, this circle of like it will it will wane come back wane come back i suppose if if, if, if if those systems are out there so you basically you've got you've got a bunch of aviation systems written in fortran and those okay. platforms like a 737 it's too expensive we saw this with the max it's too expensive to rebuild the whole platform so until the 737's platform is retired and 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 on all the existing variants that are out there that have to have maintenance are retired, which is maybe 30 years. There's going to be Fortran, and every single bank, airline reservation system, all the major business transaction systems back offices are still using COBOL, but they're not changing that much. It's really every time there's an event where there's a spike because of some change in the in the in the world that requires modifications, then you're going to see the spike in demand, but then it's going to sit back to the sort of mean. You need, it's like a surge capacity. You need like a cloud platform of containers of of virtualized COBOL programmers that you can stick in a Docker and you can like spin them up. Totally. <laughs> Freeze-dried COBOL programmers is what you need. You I mean, I would think that there wouldn't be the, the the people who know the code that much anymore, too. I would think all retiring or all, you know, uh, of like, so you're saying I have a good couple years to beef up on this and get back in the game what you're saying i mean well actually it's a good point a lot of these systems are actually very similar there's a lot of like you know t24 financial systems or the res saber reservation should all the airlines and all the systems club together and say we're going to fund a group of people to not only know cobol but know all the systems that currently exist that use cobol that are need that are strategic it's like a strategic reserve and we will pay them to basically be available and we'll pool our resources so that we're not relying on one company having to pay for that it's like an insurance like a like a sort of insurance a mutualized insurance for like for, for trying and COBOL. Well, it's true. A lot of the other stuff, like if you think about open source being used for SSL and the the, the open the, the heart, heartbeat uh, vulnerability, people working for free are, are underpinning the entire economy. You know, should there be this this pool of open source and legacy technologies that 
big companies and all companies pay a tax into that actually funds people to maintain these and improve them, improve the security. And instead of throwing away that COBOL app, maybe we can maintain it and improve it. I love your idea. I think that's yeah. awesome. like the insurance with all like all the companies that still use it get together. Uh, that's an awesome idea. We do with open source already. You have like Sony, I'm yeah, sure right. sources sponsoring Appium and Selenium and Oracle was when people sponsored Java. Could we not do it with some of these legacy tech? Have the big companies have an actual fund? Because you're right, they're gonna retire and it's not just the technology of the syntax, it's also the, the domain knowledge of the app that it was written in. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I like your point about yeah. what? There's a new COVID Sorry. hobby. Yeah, see, <laughs> yeah, brush it. Yes, it's yeah, get to it. <laughs> I mean, you, you could go on GitHub, get the GitHub, have a you know COBOL repositories, have COBOL where you yeah. actually are building, you know, and people are paid to maintain this stuff and open and share the knowledge and study the non secure stuff. Yeah, totally, totally. Wow. New hobby coming my way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's um, wind down on a little this is sort of a fun one too um what are some of the oddest things you've realized you've missed doing because of the pandemic it's not odd but being at a hotel bar uh and and meeting new people and being with like everyone after a show you know you all included yeah. the, the hotel catered stuff like things that i used to hate i meant like i really find myself missing right yeah I'd say the same thing. I'd say I, we all miss having a little bit of me time on planes. <laughs> yeah. Like someone will bring you a drink and you can watch a movie. <laughs> You're all caught up. Uh, yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, that's and the true. Hotel. Yeah, and the, and the room service. Just travel, oh, yeah. just generally travel. <laughs> yeah. Travel, yeah. sure. Yeah. Buffets. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Although actually, I, I think I told Jessica I, I I went to we went to the beach for for our vacation this year. It was in driving distance. They had a breakfast buffet still. Really. During COVID, we had to wear wow. masks. It was a Comfort Inn Suites in and Chincoteague, Virginia, and my, it was very clean. They cleaned the oh my god, and they had a hot tub, and they are cleaning it all the time, and it was crazy. They were like, fully legal cleaning it every every single day. Every time someone went anywhere, they clean it, but they did have it. So we can still have these things, but yeah. it was like a, it was it was really weird. And then the little shampoos. I was like, oh my god, little shampoos! I haven't had those for six months. <laughs> where, 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 where was this? Where was this place? I gotta go to Chickadee, Virginia. Is that? Yeah, it, it's 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 a it, it's a national seashore. It's a national wildlife refuge, and they've got a Hampton and a Comfort Suites. And it's and there's, and there's no boardwalk, so you go to the beach, and there's no one. Around. I mean, it's very it's not quiet. The beach is you know got people, but there's no like entertainment on the beach, so you don't have all the crowding. And they the, the hotel had a breakfast buffet and the little sh shampoo bottles and the hot tub we thought would be closed, but it was open. I'm like, wow, it's like so last year. <laughs> I'm there. I'm so there. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. They had a buffet. I mean, it's I'm sure they could keep it clean, but it just seems so antithetical to what's. Whatever going. wore masks and you had to you took the food outside to the an open deck by the beat by, by the kind of the channel where you could get you know you wouldn't have to eat inside. Some people did eat inside. Some people were in, eat inside watching the TV like they used to do. Like wow, this is like it's like last year. <laughs> <laughs> it was so 2019, baby. <laughs> well, hopefully soon we will all be back at the hotel bars and with our baby shampoos. <laughs> at our buffets, at a conference, and our hot sauce. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the martinis. And the martini. And if if you email me at cat c a t dot s t v a n s at saucelab dot com, I will and send me a mailing address. I will send you some hot sauce. So cat dot stevens at saucelabs dot com. I will send yeah. you hot sauce. That is awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. And thank you, Jane. It was so us. good to see you guys again. I can't wait for our next meeting at a hotel bar. And if not, mm -hmm. that if not, if that can't be sooner, then we'll just have to do some martini okay. testing here. Sounds good. You go. Perfect. That was great. Thank you again for hosting and having this. It's a great idea. And yeah, I had a blast. So yeah, hope it was awesome. great. It, it was great. Awesome. Glad you had fun. We'll talk. Right, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.